You're listening to the Patriot Nation Podcast. All right, welcome into another edition of the Patriot Nation podcast. As always, this episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, which is the official uh, daily fantasy sports app of CLNS Media. You got to download the app, put in CLNS, and they will match your first offer 100% up to $100. And today, we have a very special episode. We are welcoming in one of our favorite guests on the show, on the program. Uh, it is, he is a, a Patriots reporter for NBC Sports Boston and the host of the Next Path podcast, Phil Perry. Phil, thanks for coming through, man. We uh, we appreciate you being here, sir. What's up, boys? Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Of course, of course. This is our favorite our favorite time of the year. It is uh, it is draft season. Uh, we're uh, we're very excited. Also, one more thing, I'm very excited about my uh, my sister. As I mentioned on here, did have a baby uh, on Pi Day, actually. Which, as a math teacher, I'm doubly happy about that. It makes me a, an uncle for the first time. And yesterday. They asked me to be the godfather and gave me this. Look at this shit. Look at that. Are you wow. kidding me? Incredible. So, wow. so there you go. A little shout out to, uh, to yeah. Kelly and Mike and Rosie over there. Uh, awfully excited about it. Congratulations really to the father. entire family. <laughs> yes. And to yes, you. That's a big, you. that's a big title now. It is. It is. It's a big title. So uh, to to. that's right. <laughs> that's very true. That's very true. So, all right, let's get into the draft. Let's get into the draft, Phil, because that's why we're here. That's why we're all here. We're talking about it off air a little bit, and we're just stretching this thing out, baby. We're just milking it for everything it's worth. This is so much. This is the fun. This is the fun part for me, right? Where it's like, let's you know, let's get as much, let's get as much mileage as we possibly can out of this. Patriots are drafting at number three. Haven't had this high of a pick since nineteen ninety. Well, since nineteen ninety three, when they drafted number one overall and took Drew Blood. So, what do you? What do you want? Forget about forget about what you think they're going to do. What do you want them to do at three? So this is interesting because last time I was on here with you guys, we were talking about how much I liked Jaden Daniels and how I thought he might be the best quarterback in the class. And I understood that he was older. And mm-hmm. I understood also that he was having a ton of success in the SEC and was an explosive play machine. And did that was, to me, it was going to be hard – for me to put, you know, assuming Caleb Williams is sort of out of the equation, it's going to be hard for right. me to put anybody above that guy. But I have since been moved. And so I credit I credit you guys for, for helping me move to my current take, which is that if he's there at three overall, the Patriots should not pass on Drake May. And they should hope and pray to God that Drake May ends up available to them at number three. Because... If for a variety of reasons. And listen, a lot – I boy, it's over a month, I think, since we last spoke. Definitely was pre-combine. Yes, for sure. And yep. if you're like me and you're covering a, a team during the year, during the football season, and you're getting into the draft process later than most, and your reporting starts on the draft process, you learn a lot about these guys. And what I've learned about Drake May, what I've learned about Jaden Daniels, who I still like, um, but that has helped lead me to Drake May as, in my opinion, being the best quarterback prospect in this draft. And so if he's there, in my opinion, the Patriots should take him. I like it. We we will take full credit. And, you know, anytime you want to give us a shout out, you feel free to give us credit wherever you'd like. We'll uh, we'll gladly take it. I don't remember. <laughs> Get you know, I'll take the credit. I don't know if it's all <laughs> us or not, but what the heck, you know what I mean? Well, what's gonna be um, great is you guys are gonna tell me now that you're off of Drake May, no, and that you're <laughs> on to JJ McCarthy. That would be great. No, well, well, Matt, I, Matt's teetering, he's the he's the Wolverine no, I, over there, but I, I love JJ McCarthy. I in no world am I considering him at the third overall pick. That is that is far too high for him. Uh, I know you said you like Jaden Daniels a lot too. So are you of the mind that you just stick at three and take a quarterback no matter what happens, or are you open to a trade back? Yeah, I mean, I I think a trade back, and Karn and I have fought on this a bunch. I, I I can see the argument for it, especially if Daniels is there, because 
in my opinion, there is enough there to warrant real trepidation with him. Mm-hmm. And for me, it starts with his size, quite frankly, and his play style. I think you have to marry those two things together. When you are a player who is as and has been as dependent on the scramble as Daniels has been, who has a very high propensity for scrambling when under pressure, like abnormally high, and you get it because he's such a great athlete and he can create explosive plays at the drop of a hat with his legs. I worry about that kind of play style when you weigh probably about 200 pounds. Yeah, I know he weighed in at 210 at his pro day. My guess is he has been working very hard. Um, He has to have been. He's got smart people around him. I'm sure he's been working very hard to put on weight. My question would be, is that weight going to stick? And where is he in November of 2024 when he is looking at his 24th birthday? You know, for a guy who's been in essentially a pro level program when it comes to weight training and nutrition at LSU. Now, how closely college kids are, are following that, you know, is is a, probably a fair question. Yeah. Uh, but he's got all the resources in the world there to be able to put on weight for a guy who's always been long and relatively lanky. That that would scare me. His availability scares me. Um, you know, I think there are – I think there is a, a range of outcomes, as there are with all of these players, that would be somewhat concerning – uh, you know, there are quarterbacks that we've seen in the past who have relatively high pressure to sack rates, quarterbacks who would prefer to win pressured run as opposed to scramble to throw. Um, and and some of those comps can be a little alarming. Yeah, that's sort of one of Justin Fields' issues yeah. as a pro. Um, Jalen Hurts this past year, I don't think he was fully healthy and he obviously is built much differently than Jaden Daniels, but I think there are some similarities in terms of their play style. And I think you saw some of the limitations of that play style last year with Philadelphia. So I would still take him at three to answer your question, Matt, long answer to a short Mm -hmm. question. I think I would still take him at three, but I would be more worried about taking him than taking Drake May, who at a younger age with a bigger arm in the conditions here in New England, who has you know, shown a much higher likelihood of being able to, to test tighter windows over the middle, which you have to do at the next level. It, those things are way more intriguing to me, and I'd be willing to, to uh, bet on his improvement with some of the things that I think he struggles with now, struggles being sort of a relative term. Um, I'm more willing to to roll the dice on May than I am on Daniels, though I I would ultimately roll the dice on both. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's an interesting it's an interesting proposition, and you know the conversation going on in the chat about scramblers versus you know guys that are are pocket passers, and I just think I, I the biggest concern that I have with Jaden Daniels, and it, it's it's funny because the athletic kind of turned me on to it. Um, and they were talking about Nate Tyson and uh, Dane Brugler talking about how, you know, when he breaks the pocket, he's running. He's not extending plays. He's running. And that's fine when you play for LSU. I, I just – I don't know if it's fine when you play in the NFL. You know, that that's the one thing that I don't know. And, again, his size – you mentioned it, like his frame, it's not like you can add 30 pounds onto his frame. I just don't see that happening. He just doesn't have the frame that you're going to be able to do that. And so those are the two biggest concerns for me is the size and then his willingness to extend the play and turn it into an explosive pla- you know, passing play is really the biggest concern that I have. And so, you know, we'll see. But I just, in my personal opinion, I feel like if Jaden Daniels is there at three, I understand taking him. But I also look at it and think, I don't know if he's ever going to be Lamar Jackson. I worry about him. I worry about that comp because Lamar Jackson is such a unicorn. Then again, the the, the, the comp I've seen for Drake May that I like the best is Josh Allen, and he's a unicorn too. So then you start to wonder, like, oh, man, like are we – so that's that's the hard mm-hmm. thing that I look at and say, like, you're asking these guys to be incredible players. They might both turn out to be really good players. I don't know. I just, um, 
I just wonder if, you know, I think you have a better chance at May, in my opinion. Yeah, I I think we've just, we've seen that to compete in the AFC, you know, you've, you're going to have to beat Patrick Mahomes. You're going to have to beat Josh Allen. You're going to have to beat Joe Barry. You're going to have to beat Lamar Jackson, maybe Justin Herbert. I just think you need to take a big swing at that position. You need to, you need to bet on the high, high, high end upside and try to get into that arms race and really contend when it comes to that arms race. And while Daniels has some really enticing physical tools, I mean, he's going to be a really difficult guy to defend at the next level. You're going to have to play a lot of zone against him and you're going to know you're getting a lot of zone against him moving forward because if you play man and he breaks the pocket, it might go for 50 yards. Like that's the kind of athlete he is. And so that's one thing that's a very, you know, that's painting in real generalities there, but, but that's the kind of thing that's going to make him, I think an effective pro at the next level is, you're going to have a pre- pretty good understanding of what kind of looks, broadly speaking, you're going to be getting defensively. I think he's cleaner mechanically. I think he gets the ball out faster when he decides to throw. Um, he's He is really accurate down the field. I know he had two unbelievable wide receivers to work with at LSU, but he makes some great bucket throws down the field. There's no getting around it. I just look at the physical talent with May, the off-platform throwing ability that Daniels, to me, is athletic enough to pull off, but he, we just don't see it as much. Again, when he's off his spot, he's running. And so I worry about that style of quarterbacking when you are as um, – I'm trying to put this appropriately. When, when you are built the way he's built. You know, it's, it's, it's science, <laughs> you know, like yeah. if you're like getting hit in the sec is no joke, no question about it. That's the best there is in college football. It's still not the NFL. And so that to me, when we're talking, you know, I thought it was interesting. Gerard Mayo was talking about floors the other day at the owner's meetings, you know, he's talking about Drake may specifically. Okay. You got to look at his ceiling, unbelievable ceiling. There is no ceiling, but you got to consider his floor too. And that's what we, the, the Patriots have to consider. I think the floor for Jane Daniels is that he's he's not on the field. Like it's like it's Robert Griffin esque, like meaning his career's over, you know, in, in relatively short order, shorter than you would like. And yeah. that's me being doom and gloom and painting a dire circumstance. But when you're talking about floors and worst case scenarios, it's he's not on the field. He's not available to you. Um, and so that's what would give me the most pause. But I but I think the big playability is there in such a way that you'd still be willing to risk it at three. The thing for me is with both of these guys, you have to go all in to surround them with the right pieces to allow yourselves to get the best out of these guys. The floor conversation, if you're the Patriots right now and you're having that talk, like that's on you is what I would say, right? That that's on you, Gerard Mayo. That's on you, Elliot Wolf. That's on Mm -hmm. Alex Van Pelt. Make sure these guys never sniff their floors because of all the talent you put around them, because of the great coaching that you gave them. Like the floor shouldn't be your concern because you believe in your ability to never allow that player, whoever it is, to get close to his floor. That that's what I would say. And so, um, you know, I, I think I like these guys in their, in their, um, varied outcomes enough understanding what the floors might be to take both at three starting with may though. I, and I really, I, I go back and forth. I don't know how you guys feel about it. I do go back and forth on whether or not he'll actually be available at three. You know, I think in a, an analytically driven team, which they appear they will be under Josh Harris, new owner there would take the younger guy with a you really high upside and the, the ability to attack the middle of the field, the way Drake may does. The GM, Adam Peters, was in San Francisco for the Trey Lance experience. Young guy with a lot of physical upside. Didn't go so well. So maybe he's going to want the more experienced player that might be more ready to go right now. So uh, I wonder, I don't know if there's any disagreement. I have no idea what what's going on behind closed doors in Washington right now. But if there was some disagreement, 
between those two sides, uh, who would win that battle? Usually it's the guy who owns the team who wins that battle. Mm. Yeah. And what, I mean, I think Washington is so interesting because they've been so tight lipped. We have no idea what they want to do. Um, and it feels like, you know, every, I, I don't, I don't believe any of the leaks I'm hearing because, you know, there weren't leaks in the coaching search either, right. not until the search ended and all the stuff of Ben Johnson happened and all that. So um, it's weird, but go, going back to Jaden Daniels, um, I think, you know, one of the things that gives me pause with him is Anthony Richardson this past season, a guy who's much bigger, much stronger, who got hurt you know, multiple times, who had to leave multiple games early before having his entire season ended early. And that's a guy who I think plays similarly to Jaden Daniels. I think that's a, a rough comp, but, um, you know, can withstand it and didn't. And you look at Daniels and he's withstood it in the SEC. So maybe maybe he just has some some magic powers in that thin frame of his, and uh, you know that he's able to withstand those hits because he's so small. I don't know, but um, I, I get concerned. And then you know, if you look at a situation where he's missing time, um, it hurts his development. There's also the fact that he has some bad habits with his the way he runs, like you talked about, not not scrambling to throw the ball, and that'll take time to coach out. But their supporting cast isn't great, and as a, if as a rookie. The offense isn't good, and you're asking Jaden Daniels to put on his superhero cape to move the ball at all and go 2020 Cam Newton so you can have any serviceable offense, and he's getting hurt. Now you're reinforcing the bad habits, and, you know, he's hurt, and it's hurting his development. And I think you look at a situation where, you know, he might not have a good cast around him until year two or year three, and by then it's too late in the development and you've ruined right. it. That, that's my big concern with him. Yeah, and, and I think it is worth pointing out what Brian Kelly told reporters the other day is is my understanding is is the real concern with Jay Daniels is will he slide? <laughs> Does he know how to slide? I mean, we've All seen right. we've seen him do it um, very rarely, but we have seen him do it. Can he do it more? It, you know, what is it about him that doesn't allow him to protect himself better? You know, even if you don't ask him to scramble less. Mm-hmm. When he does, can you ask him to do a better job of getting out of bounds, understanding when the play is over, and living to to see another day? Because um, there are just too many massive, massive hits on his college tape <laughs> that would suggest that he's going to do a great job of staying healthy as a pro. And I, I've talked to you know quarterbacks, coaches about this. It can be difficult to teach a guy to slide, you know, if, especially if they haven't learned it by this point in their careers where they're they're going pro and um, they've, you know, played a certain style to get them to this point, and now all of a sudden you're asking them to do something that they haven't really done all that consistently before. That's that's a difficult one for me. So would you, Matt and Pat, would you guys pass on Daniels at three and trade down to the? What I've been calling this the Tommy Curran plan because he has been shouting from the rooftops that he wants to trade down. Now he has said, I don't know specifically where he stands today on this. He has said that he would not trade down if Daniels was there. He likes Daniels more than May. Okay. So he has said if May is there, trade back. If Daniels is there, don't. Well, where do you guys stand on that? Yeah, that's where I'm at. And I, I have May ahead of Daniels. And so I just feel like if Daniels is there at three, if May goes two, I'm moving out and taking, a, you know, assuming you can get a godfather offer, I'm taking it, right? I'm, I'm taking. 11, 23 in your first round pick next year, or I'm taking, you know, 12 and their second round pick and their first round pick next year, or, you know, or whatever, Wh- whatever pick it is. Right. And I almost wonder, you know, would the giants, like, I don't know, would the giants move from six and give you their first round pick next year for, you know, for that guy, whether it's Jake May or Jaden Daniels, and then at six, you either take, you know, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, or Joe Walt, depending on who's available, right? And I, you know, so I, I don't know. I, I just, like, those are kind of all interesting prospects to me. Like, do you, you know, I, that's how, that's kind of how I'm looking at it is, you know, where are you going to go at it? But I don't, I wouldn't take Daniels at three personally because I feel like there's too much value because these guys are so good. Right. And, and they're viewed as so good. Now, if you're not getting anything, if Minnesota's saying, yeah, we'll give you 11 and, you know, I don't know, or second round pick or something like that, well, then no. But 
I'm not just going to trade back to trade back, but if I can get a big haul and move back and set myself up to grab a bunch of good players in this draft and have a future first round pick next year, then I'm doing it. Yeah. Uh, I'm trading down if it's Daniels, um, uh, obviously for the right offer. And if it's May, I love May. I'm considering it. Um, I love Drake May, but I think he's also clearly a guy who's going to take time to develop. Like his his splash plays are incredible. His splash pay, plays are things that, you know, if he puts his game together, he can be a Hall of Fame quarterback. But the floor on him is just so low because he can be so inconsistent. Um, and if they're looking at May and they're saying, hey, he needs time to develop and we don't have a situation to develop him right now and we got a good offer on the table, if – the Patriots think that's the right way to go with it. I can absolutely get on board with that. Um, and the, the other team I'd look at here for a trade, I think if you're in New England, uh, would be the Raiders in mm -hmm. large part because the Raiders are a team right now with no better than the third best head coach in that division with probably the worst GM in that division and no better than the third best quarterback in that division. And if you can trade with them and get a future first, you might be getting yourself a, a top 10 or top five pick next year as part of that. Uh, just because, you know, I think if you can bet against a team that's playing in the division with Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid and Justin Herbert and Jim Harbaugh, um, I would like that, especially if you can, you know, get multiple years of future firsts if this becomes a real bidding war. Um, so, you know, obviously I, I like the QBs, but this team needs so much help that, uh, I think everything's on the table. Here's what I would worry about in trading out is the future drafts at that quarterback position. Right. If you if you go back through, because in all likelihood you're not you're not going to get one overall. You know, unless something mm -hmm. miraculous happens to you and you're you know uh, you're the Bears, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you right. made a pick with the Panthers, and they ended up sucking again, and they give you the number one overall pick because of it. In all likelihood, whoever has that one overall pick is not going to be you, and they're not going to be willing to let it go. Most drafts, most drafts, and this this includes drafts where the, even the one overall quarterback sucked, but most drafts you do not want to be drafting a quarterback that isn't taken it number one overall the most drafts you look after that first overall pick mm -hmm. and it's it's pretty rare to find a quarterback that you actually like you know last year is a good example because cj stroud and good for him and patrick mahomes obviously is an obvious example and josh allen is an obvious example but you could go back through it the last 15 years or so there's maybe like four or five classes i i don't have the numbers up um in front of me right now but i did go back and look it's alarming how often the quarterback stinks if you're drafting a quarterback in the first round and he's not the first overall pick. So that's what gives that's what scares me is you can you can say until you're blue in the face, well, we'll wait until the next quarterback, the next good quarterback. We'll wait, wait, wait until the night, right time and we'll pounce. And everybody remembers the Patrick Mahomes example because he's already one of the best we've ever seen. It's just so rare that you get an opportunity to get a guy that's even – worthy of a first round pick yeah and well, that, that's what i would be afraid of I, you you can hope that you could get a guy in the second round you can hope you get dak prescott or brock purdy or somebody else as you're building the roster up but that's luck to me so yeah. I, I don't love that plan either the only the only thing i'll say about that is that i was having this conversation with my buddy and this is a conversation we had on on the show a few weeks ago i do think if you look back if you look at the top 15 re quarterbacks in the nfl right now I would think that the majority of them were not the first quarterback taken in their draft. Well, and I, I, th I think if I mean? you, you can you can add a caveat to that too, where there's a whole bunch of guys who are like legitimate starters who were the top quarterback taken, who aren't you know the top aren't, aren't where they were drafted. You know, you look at Matthew Stafford right. and Jared Goff and Baker Mayfield and right. all kinds of guys like. But that I just think have, I think if you yeah. look at that top, you know, the top fifteen that those are guys that, you know, weren't necessarily taken as the first. So, so that's because I was having a conversation it's, with my buddy that said, like, if you, my buddy said, if you have the number one pick, you should always trade the number one pick. <laughs> so I was like, okay, like, let's slow down a little bit. But, but his argument was that very rarely do you, does the number one pick hit to a point where that guy is the best quarterback in the league, right? You go back to Andrew Luck, obviously, and Trevor Lawrence has been good, but not great. And so, you know, obviously Joe Burrow is really, really good, clearly, right? 
but he might be the last one, right? And so, you know, of course, there's more research that you'd have to do and dig through a little bit. But I, I do think that, you know, when you just off the top of your head, right, you look at Jordan Love and Aaron Rodgers and, you know, Dak Prescott and, you know, Mahomes and Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson. And, you know, you go, you just go down the list and a lot of those guys were not the first quarterback taken off the board. And so, but the hard thing for me, the hard thing is that, you know, how do you know? Like that's, that's the biggest issue that I have yeah. is that I, I just, I have, it's a complete crapshoot and it's, you know, you have to feel like you know that for a fact that that guy's the guy. Uh, and I, I don't know how the hell they decide that. <laughs> you, know? you, you can make tens of millions of dollars if you can answer that question correctly with any regularity. Yeah. So I, I just think if you think Jaden Daniels in, in most other drafts, if you think Jaden Daniels would be the first or second quarterback taken, right? This might be your only chance to get like realistically get a get a top what you think is a top two. And you're right that it's uh, so much of it is luck. Yeah, but I see. I don't. I I wouldn't have him as a top one or two. Taken okay, that, so then you wouldn't yeah. do it, and that's fine. But yeah. if, if you feel if you feel like he's man, this guy's really good, but our team's not ready. Right. Which is kind of how you put it, Matt, right? The team's just, ah, the situation, oof. My thing is you got to f- go. There are tools for you to figure that out. If it, yeah. And you should you should have been, you know, getting after it a little bit better in free agency, in my opinion. The trade avenue is still an avenue. Do everything within your power to make the situation better. And when you have the amount of money that they have, um, then that's something that should be within the realm of possibility for them. And if they feel like they have the quarterback that they need, then, you know, trading picks to surround that guy with what he needs, that yeah. should be on the table too. Well, well let me ask you is that that, oh, that leads to, you know, paying Christian Kirk ungodly amounts of money to, to be your wide receiver one when you, when you got Trevor Lawrence. I think, I think that's the tough part is like, there's no, well, you can't, you can't, you can't screw it up. <laughs> you, start, yeah. you could do well, what the Eagles did and make good decisions. <laughs> that's correct. Be a yeah, smart that's team, not a dumb one, I guess is what I would say. That's, uh, that's, you could be the Bills and Stefan Diggs. You could be all yeah. these teams that have done so much that's to help the these guys. And like, that's what I, that's why I look at like the floor conversation. I'm like, just because you found a way, to, to help a first round quarterback to absolute rock bottom by making such a series of bad decisions one after the next with Mac Jones doesn't mean that that should happen with the next, that shouldn't even be in the realm of possibility. And it's within their control. Like right. it, this idea that you just draft a guy and then, well, boy, you hope he's good and you pray like, that's not what it is. It's, it's a nurture part team too. building. It's yeah. team building. It's team building. Yeah. So well, are you uh, are you on board with trading for Brandon Ayuk then? Because that's something I've been saying they should do. Uh, yeah, I would be I would be down for that. Now, the question is, what does it cost? You know, so if it's if it's more than thirty four overall, that's starting to get to be a little bit much. <laughs> I do I I wouldn't hate it at thirty four overall. Um, yeah, because I do think. Well, I think this year's receiver draft class is good. Um, especially at the top, it's great. I don't think there are a ton of true X receivers, which is what the Patriots, in my opinion, really need. Yeah. And so Xavier Leggett, is he to some does somebody else in the league feel the same way and take him at the back half of the first round? Like, I don't know. But you know, A. D. Mitchell, Xavier Leggett, and Brian Thomas, I think is gonna go in the teens somewhere, maybe. Like, you know, that these guys are not gonna last very long. And so if you think the best receiver on the board when you're picking might be Lad McConkey or Ricky Pearsall, like I like those guys, but they're not, it's not really what they need. It, they need, not they need ones, a boundary right. presence, you know, that can do a lot of different things for them. And so, um, so I'd be, I'd be open to trading for somebody like that for sure. Or T Higgins, I, I'd be, you know, I know he had yeah. a down year last year and he scares me a little bit cause he's not um, like the, the explosive physical freak that I think uh, you can be and some other guys, obviously, but you know, he's not AJ Brown. Um, but I, I'd feel better about having that guy at that position. than uh, we can go through some of the names, but it's, it's just, it's not a real deep class of boundary guys. I just did our prototypical Patriots for, um, for the receiver spot and, trying to base it off of the Ron Wolf executive tree and what those guys have drafted in the past. And 
Um, there are certain thresholds where it looks like they, you know, they want guys to hit and, um, there are some really intriguing names, but they run pretty dry after Leggett and Mitchell, you know, yeah. Johnny Wilson, anybody interested in Johnny Wilson, okay. six foot six, 231 pounds. He's actually a little bit more fluid mover than I thought he was, or I thought he would be. Yeah. Uh, but, but I wouldn't feel good about him being like my ex receiver of the future. Oh, like, no. come on. No. What, so, what about Troy Franklin? Too light. I mean, it took for them, I think. Yeah. Um, do I like him? I like the speed element, but he's 175 pounds. These Wolf executives have drafted 18 receivers in the first or second round. This is Ron Wolf guys or guys that have been become GMs after working for Ron Wolf. 18 first and second round receivers. Um, and 15 of them were 197 pounds or heavier. So they're, they're looking for bigger bodies early at least, you know, Randall, Cobb, you got a couple outliers in there, Dwayne Eskridge and Randall Cobb. But for the most part, it's, um, you know, it's Greg Jennings, it's Jordy Nelson, it's Devontae Adams, it's DK Metcalf, it's Amari Cooper, um, Michael Crabtree, you know, like, so like yeah. 6'1", 6'2", 205, you know, who can run routes and um, do a lot of different things for you. So that's the kind of guy I think Elliot will be looking for. Um, by the way, these guys don't draft, receivers in the first round hardly ever <laughs> so quick. if they trade yeah. so if they trade down my guess is it would be for a tackle not for a receiver yeah. but they've drafted a ton of guys in the second round and they've been bigger body guys you know christian watson that are that yep. look the part you know that are really truly specimens someone uh threw this name up there hayden hatton who's a, a deep sleeper from idaho uh probably going to be a, a late day three pick but i like him mm -hmm. Uh, Jalen, Jalen Coker him. as well. Jalen Coker, who's a guy from, uh, Holy, Holy Cross, Cross as well, who's yeah. gotten some love too. So, but I liked Hatton. Hatton isn't, isn't the fastest guy, but he, he does have the frame. Um, the, the trade down scenarios are interesting. The Ayuk thing, I would probably give up a, a pick next year as well. I, my, in my head was 34 or fifth and maybe your third or fourth round pick next year. And that's a lot, but you're getting a number one, in my opinion, you're getting a number one wide receiver. Now, the other question I had for you, because we talked about Ayuk, we don't really need to necessarily go back to that, but what, what's your feelings on Michael Penix? If we, if the Patriots were to trade back, not drafted three, let's just say take the deal from, you know, I like taking the deal from Minnesota because you get two first round picks, but regardless of who you're getting that second pick from, I think you want at least two picks, you know, in this first round, in this, you know, top, 60 picks or top 50 picks or whatever, regardless of what you're also getting next year. You know, how do you feel about taking a left tackle, let's say, and a wide receiver and then moving up? You know, let's say you do 11 and 23 and you take a left tackle and a wide receiver and then move up from 34 and take, you know, Michael Penix at 27 or whatever the case may be. That would be a little rich for me and I'd be comfortable with if I decide I'm not taking a quarterback at three overall i'm cool with passing on it entirely in the first round yeah uh, i just feel as though if you don't feel so strongly about a quarterback that you're not willing to take him at three you probably shouldn't use a first round pick on him and there's very small sample size of evidence to suggest that um quarterbacks that were taken in the first round and their teams traded down before taking them and the list includes Patrick Ramsey and Rex Grossman and Kerry Collins and EJ Manuel and maybe one or two other. It's a bad list. Yeah, and, no. and, and my takeaway from that, even though it's an incredibly small sample and I get it, that's over 30 years, right? So teams don't do this generally speaking. And I think it's because they, in some ways trust their gut. <laughs> and if they don't right. feel so good about the guy that they're willing to take him at their original slot, they still don't feel good enough about him to take him in the first round. So I wouldn't do that. Penix in general, I'm not um, entirely out on. And I, I love a lot about Penix's game. His arm is tremendous. And his ability to throw the ball down the field is tremendous. And I love his makeup because of everything that he's been through and the toughness that he's shown and the adversity that he's personally pushed himself through to, to get himself to where he is now. I worry about his injury history. Mm -hmm. um, having two ACLs to the same knee is a real long-term concern to me so if you're taking a quarterback in the first round you hope he's the quarterback for 10 years i feel less good 
about Michael Penix being able to do that than I do some of these other guys who don't have the same concerns. I do have some concerns about his playing style too, mm-hmm. um, because, and I don't know if this is just because, um, you know, you, you try to look at it from all angles, right? Why does it feel like he's more of a pocket bound guy than some other players? Because he tested great. He's clearly a, a really good athlete, right? The other day at his pro day, yeah. jumps 36 inches and he runs a four or five. Like he can move. He's a, he's an athlete. Why didn't we see more of that? Why, um, you know, Michigan's a great team. Why when pressured against Michigan, did it look like it went to hell? Why uh, does some of the underneath stuff not look as natural as some of the deep stuff does for him? Um, again, he's another older player, a little bit like Daniels, right? He's, he's played a lot of college football. He's been in college for a long time. Um, so I wouldn't take him in the first round. If you wanted to take him on day two and and sort of hope that you, you hit on a guy who has an injury concern coming in and it doesn't crop up the way you think it might, then great. Um, but I would be more inclined to – if I'm passing on quarterback at three, maybe pass on it until like the third round. And I might prefer to take somebody like Spencer Rattler in the third or fourth round um, I than I would take Michael Penix in the first. All right. I like that. Also, so we've gone back and forth about QB rankings and whatnot. And a guy that I think, you know, I think AVP is going to have a good amount of insight into it. But I also think... Ben McAdoo is going to have a lot of insight into it. And Ben McAdoo has been a guy that has consistently kind of had a really good feel for quarterbacks. And, you know, historically over the last 10 years or so has done a really nice job in identifying who's good and who isn't. His 2018 quarterback rankings, he had Baker Mayfield sixth, who went number one, of course. Number one was Josh Allen. Number two was Lamar Jackson. And then number three was Sam Darnold. To me, what that tells me is that he has Drake May extremely high on his board. And so, again, I, I don't know if Drake May goes to three. Someone asked about it earlier. Would you consider – it's, it's kind of crazy. Would you consider trying to move from three to two? So just just to give you an idea, obviously uh, Chicago did it back in, what, 2017, uh, the Mahomes draft, where they moved from three to two. They gave up three. They gave up 69 or whatever. They gave up uh, like a fifth round pick and a third round the next year or something like that. And so that's kind of, I was thinking like three, 103, I think it is. And, uh, you know, their third round pick next year or something. That's a lot to move up one spot. But if you really feel that May is that much better than Daniels, would you consider you know, and of course, I don't know if you feel that way, but if you, you know, if you were like May's the guy, I don't know if Daniels is, would you consider making that move? I guess I would consider it uh, because if if you feel like he is clearly your favorite, then it's worth almost anything um, to make right. sure that you get him. I just don't know how realistic it is that Washington would move out of there knowing that they also need a quarterback. Um did they have those two players so close together, May and Daniels, that they don't care and they're just happy to take the draft capital? My guess is no. They're, they're spending a lot of time paying attention to these quarterbacks right now. My guess is they have one that they like more than the other, um, even if we don't know who that is. I love the point about McAdoo because that 2018 ranking is very different than the one that Elliot Wolf had. Um, because yeah. we have Elliot Wolf on the record as the assistant GM in Cleveland saying Baker Mayfield was the best quarterback I scouted this year. And so did Elliot Wolf learn from that draft class? And looking back on it, he obviously, I would guess, would rather have Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson now than Baker Mayfield after seeing it play out for a few years. Right, yeah. Um, does he look at McAdoo and say, you know, you, you had it right and I didn't? And is there is is that level of humility shown, or do the same things still apply to Elliot Wolf and what he values at the position? Toughness, leadership, boxy, get the players to play for you. Baker Mayfield had all of those things, had an edge to him, a competitiveness to him. Uh, all that intangible stuff uh, was great with Baker Mayfield, and he was a really accurate and really productive college quarterback. You know, does that does he? 
see J.J. McCarthy, for instance, as sort of a maybe a little less rough around the edges Baker Mayfield. <laughs> Yeah. And that he's not a huge guy. He's taller than than Baker, but you know can run around and throw on the move, and is a good enough athlete, and has a pretty good arm and leadership and intangibles and moxie yeah. and all the stuff that you hear about JJ right. McCarthy. You, you, know, you right. heard about Baker Mayfield, whereas McAdoo saying, "Yeah, that stuff's nice, but we need the guy with the big arm and the the bigger hands." You know, JJ McCarthy's hands are only nine inches. It's uh, you know very much on the smaller end, mm -hmm. and I could see McAdoo saying, I, "I know you guys like a lot about this guy, but I I just can't get over how small his hands are, especially we're going to be playing in New England here. Let's remember that." Now Drake May's hands aren't huge either. He's nine and one eighth, so is McAdoo out on both of these guys? Right. <laughs> and is he looking at Michael Penix, who's got, I think, 10 and a half inch hands or 10 and a quarter or something like that, and saying, now that's our guy right there. I don't care about his knees. Um, that, to me, would be interesting, just the back and forth and the experience these guys have with different types of players. You know, Van Pelt, obviously, has been around um, Aaron Rodgers. And does he look at, you know, it, Aaron Rodgers? You know, uh, he's part of a staff that at one point in time thought, Deshaun Watson was, you know, worth moving heaven and earth for. Uh, so does he look at May as somebody and he said, man, we need that guy who can, who can run around, who can create, who can scramble to throw, buy time in the pocket, has great arm strength, put the ball wherever he wants down the field. I think there's going to be some, you know, conflicting opinions, which I think is good. As long as at the end of the day, the people who matter most are on the same page and feel really strongly and really convicted in whatever they do at three like i you know i know they've had all these nine guys on the, the scouting trail they don't all need to be involved in this decision i i i'm happy i if i'm them i'd be happy to have all their opinions and all their evaluations and how they feel about all these players but i don't need like tc mccartney on draft night telling elliot wolf hey we got to trade out because our guy's not there at three. like i all due yeah. respect to tc mccartney like i want to know what he thinks about the players but that's like a very high level organizational decision that only a, a handful of people should be a part of um, yeah, not the first time quarterbacks coach. So, um, so anyway, that, that, that to me is, is a fascinating sort of subplot to this. These guys who have a ton of experience in their field with what I imagine will be differing opinions on how these top quarterbacks stack up. I agree. I agree. Uh, We've taken up, double the amount of time that we said we we're going to fill and we appreciate you coming through you lasted people giving you crap for being on the couch or watching tv or whatever you're not watching tv locked in i am locked in but but i just will say your boston red sox are up eight nothing on the oakland Get athletics that. right now so and the the a's have i believe five errors in this game already wagon. I don't want to oh, hear it, yeah. Matt. The, the red sox are clearly a wagon and we're going to get to both of them well, worth paying attention to both can be true. The Red Sox can be good. Yep. The A's can be bad. We can do both sides of this. I have the. I'm uh, glad I can't see those chats. By the way, I don't. I don't know if it's <laughs> something that's on my phone. We did have, I have to the, uh, change machinery here wall. because my my computer microphone wasn't working. So now we're on the phone. I can't see. And that's what I was gonna say. Phil so came on. Came on at first. We got the microphone working, but not the camera. Then we got the camera working, but not the microphone. Then we had to switch to the phone. So. Uh, we went through it. We went through it, but here we are. Uh, and, uh, apparently, we missed an Astros no hitter, according to my, uh, Matt Minito. Uh, missed, missed an Astros no hitter today. The Astros, I believe, got swept at home in four games by the Yankees to open the season, and then threw a no hitter. I believe <laughs> that that's the out. first five games of their season, right there. So that makes sense. So, <laughs> but uh, I'm watching the UConn USC game after that. Uh, after the absolute explosion from Caitlin Clark earlier today, uh, it was pretty incredible. So, oh, she's. Awesome. That lots, of, back, lots of great sports going on. With, step with those back, Caitlin Clark back, pull up three. Like oh, yeah. insane. With those those passes she was throwing, can she, you know, come out and be quarterback? <laughs> I know. Uh is she gonna be available at three overall? That's the question. I know, right? Well, that's what everyone's talking about. What DJ DJ Jones coming out. Not DJ Jones, DJ uh who's the hell of the kids from NC State? Oh. Oh, is it Hayden? No, no, no. That, uh, that's no, the quarterback. The, no, the uh, the the, the, the basketball, basketball player. player. Yeah, no, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. NC State. DJ Jones. Oh, DJ Hayden, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, DJ Burns. 
DJ Burns, Burns, thank you. Yeah, everyone's talking about DJ Burns. Can DJ Burns play left tackle for the Patriots or whatever? So, hey, hey he's got some of the best. I saw I Peter seen. Schrager. I saw Peter Schrager say today, if he wanted to have a, a NFL pro day after the Final Four, he'd have a lot of attention. He sure so. would. He sure would. So, I think he's going to be a stud in the, in the NBA, but we'll see. Um, but anyways, Phil, thank you so much, man. We appreciate you taking taking some time out of your night to uh, to chat with us. It's always a fun time. We always love chatting with you. And uh, before you go, please let everyone know where they can listen to you and read you and see you and everything else. I'm just uh, I'm just discovering the comments. I could get at the comments this entire time. I just never, <laughs> never um, figured it out until now. Um, you can find all of our stuff on NBCSportsBoston.com. Uh, next Pat's podcast will be twice a week um, through draft week and probably beyond um, because there's just so much to, to get to. Uh, we've got some great conversations lined up. We're going to be doing some quarterbacks. I mentioned Spencer Rattler earlier. We have a mm-hmm. conversation with him. Um, that was a lot of fun that we'll be able to share soon. Uh, we're going to get Maddie Castle, former Patriot. Great. Uh, and our great buddy uh, has done a lot of work with us at NBC Sports Boston. Um, he did a lot of Big Ten games this year, part of the Big Ten Network and NBC's coverage of the Big Ten. And so um, has seen a lot of J.J. McCarthy and um, has had a chance to interview him as well as part of the broadcast team there. So uh, we'll, we'll dive a little deeper on J.J. Right. And, um, yeah, at Phil A. Perry on Twitter and all our shows. Early edition every night, 6 o'clock, BST, late night, Um and I'll be on uh, Zolak and Bertrand again tomorrow. I was there with those guys today. I'll be on with them tomorrow uh, for the full four hours. So ten o'clock tomorrow on Sports Hub. I got a, I got a bone to pick with you about about Bertrand. My listen on the show here. I talked about my dad saying they should draft a guy at three and then take sixty eight in their first round pick next year and move back into the first round to take someone else. And what does what does Mark Bertrand say on his show today? The Patriots should draft a guy at three and then trade 68 in their first round pick next year to move back up into the first round. And I'm like, wait, my dad texted me. He was like, wait a second. That's my idea. And I'm like, well, you must listen to the show. So you- he's always, he's always watching. He's consuming everything. <laughs> hey, All we have, uh, we have some breaking NFL news. What do we have? Carson Wentz has signed with the Kansas City Chiefs. That oh. can't be real. It is listen, <laughs> April listen, Fools. It is April it's Fool's April Day. April Fools, Matt. This is from Jordan Schultz. <laughs> we gotta be aware. Head on a swivel on April Fool's this, Day. This is the real Jordan Schultz account. <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah, it's, it's certainly possible. I thought back up one year deal. Say, I thought for possible. sure you were gonna say New England Patriots with the look on your face there. Yeah, I was uh, leading to it. I would say if you were if you're using your April Fools to wait until 10:45 at night to tweet a joke about Carson Wentz signing with the Chiefs, you're a sick, sick person. Oh, someone in the someone <laughs> in the comments, someone in the comments said that uh, that the Chargers were were actively trying to trade uh, Justin Herbert to Chicago for one and nine. And I'm like, come I on. I don't know if I believe that. I was like, I'm they not even trade him. not even putting that up there. I'm not even I'm not even entertaining that on April Fool's Day. There's no chance. No chance. So Car- Carson Wentz is about to have two Super Bowl rings. Then I bet. No, 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 no. They're not going to three peat. Stop it. <laughs> so, all right. Any, I know, I know, Phil. I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to tempt fate with that. <laughs> There's just uh, they, too many. They might, they might be. They might be down a receiver given some of the latest news. Oh, yeah, you know, right. Yeah, that so, was bad. We'll see on that front. That was bad. So. Anyways, all right, Phil, thank you so much, sir. We appreciate you. Uh, We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, uh, we will get into some of Matt's mock draft and go from there, and we'll let Phil go on his way. And we appreciate you, sir. Can't wait to listen to the the next Pats and everything else, and your draft coverage is fantastic. Obviously, your your coverage all year is great, but your draft coverage is is fantastic. And so, Well, thank you. Thank um, you. That means a lot. We put a lot of work into it, but it's a a labor of love, as you guys know. Yeah. Um, so we just uh, we got almost another boy. We got almost a full month to go. So I know. strap in, guys. My by the time I talk to you, talk to you next, like I said, uh, my my new favorite quarterback in the draft class will be uh, maybe Spencer Rattler. Maybe I'll have oh him all the way. Patriots oh taking him. God. Well, there you go. Hey, you never know. You never know, right? Could happen. But if that happens, <laughs> kick me off the show. <laughs> <laughs> all right, boys. Never ever come back. All right, thanks, Phil. Take care. All right, bye. I will see you guys in a bit. 
Football season may be over, but the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it's tournament season or the fight for playoff home court, there's no shortage of high-stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Now, Prize Picks even offers injury insurance so your entries stay in play, even if one of your players gets injured. For basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays live. Now, this week for me, I have Steph Curry for more than 29 points and Nicole Yochis for more than 10 rebounds and then Caitlin Clark for more than 30 points and LeBron James for more than seven assists. So download the app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more. Pick less. It's that easy. All right, we are back. Uh, oh, he's so good, Evan Phil. On man, he's so Love flipping him. knowledgeable, and just like such a such just an awesome guy as well. So it's always uh, it's always great to have him on. All right, Matt, <laughs> your mock draft 4.0 dropped today. Um, so let's let's get into it because this one interested me, and uh, and there's a really specific reason why. And would you like to tell the people, sir, what's the main the main thing that everyone needs to know going into this mock draft, what is it, sir? Um, that you should go to the comment section and trash me for not taking a quarterback. Is that <laughs> that's it, baby? That is it. Not taking a quarterback? Are you kidding me? Yeah, I go to if you go to the comment section, there's a lot of people <laughs> upset with me <laughs> on uh, on that one. No, I mean I like I try to do mock drafts with a lot of different scenarios, and I did did one taking a QB last time, so switching yeah. it up this time. Um, this mock, I think, is interesting, very interesting, given the conversation we just had with Phil about how guys from the Ron Wolf tree treat the wide receiver position. Uh, because as he talked about, they typically like bigger bodied receivers. Mm -hmm. He also said they don't take guys in the first. That's true. And we are going to follow one of these rules in <laughs> this mock draft, <laughs> but not both of them. Uh, so we, we get into it. Uh, I have a, a double trade here. For New England, um, trade back from three with Minnesota. You get 11, you get 23, you get a future first and a future third out of it. Um, which I also, I did these trades in, um, actually, so a little peek behind the curtain for a second. Usually when I put together a mock draft, I will go through like consensus boards and just do it that way instead of actually going through a simulator. Sure. But I did this one in the PFF simulator and... Liked it way more than I expected to when I went in and said, all right, I'm going to write this up as an actual mock. So all these trades it accepted in, in the simulator, um, like except the original Vikings one, because it doesn't think the Vikings want to move up for a quarterback. So the Vikings aren't willing to give up draft picks to move up in that, which, you know, isn't realistic. Um, so the Patriots get 11, 23 to future picks. They then take 11 in that future third with Tennessee and move up to seven. Uh, the reason I, I do Tennessee in this, and the reason why I think this is realistic, Tennessee wants an offensive lineman. It's a real chance the way this this draft starts is quarterback, 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 wide receiver, wide receiver. If that's how it starts, Tennessee likes a number of offensive linemen. They can move back from seven to 11, pick up a future asset, and you know they're, they're all set. They can just take an offensive lineman there. Yeah. Because Patriots are moving up to seven, because they want a receiver. Um, in this one, I'm targeting Rome Odunze. Um, I love him. I, I think he's fantastic. Yeah. I think Odunze would be a number one receiver in a lot of classes, and he's my wide receiver three in this one. You know, he's dynamic. He's a ball winner on the outside. Very good route runner. Uh, great history of production. Fantastic work ethic. I mean, he, he checks all the boxes for what you want in a, in a boundary X receiver who can line up on the line of scrimmage and do everything from that position and, you know, can win when isolated on one side of the field. That's who you want. Um, and, you know, you look at what AVP has done with Amari Cooper the past couple seasons in Cleveland, and you could just kind of throw Odunze in that role. And I think he would do very well. Um, yeah. I, I like that a lot. I mean, Rome is just, he's a beast. He's a beast. And I, I don't know. I don't know if Tennessee would want to move down. If Joe Alt is there at seven, he's incredible. And I don't know if a third round pick next year is enough 
to have them move down and not get Joe Walt. Um, and the, the question for me is, how do you feel the drop-off is from Joe Walt to whomever you have at tackle two, right? Whether well, it's Fuaga think, or whoever, whomever else it is. And I think one of the factors here for Tennessee is they got um, – Bill Callahan to come be their offensive line coach, True. who is probably the best active offensive line coach. And I think that helps you a little bit here. Um, so I think they yeah. can be a little bit less picky with some of these. Um, may, and maybe they're pickier because they have some real expert insight and Callahan wants a guy. Uh, but right. they also might feel like we can draft anybody and they're going to be good because we have such a good offensive line coach here. And as old man mob mentions in the chat, Tyler Hughes. Um, was at Washington with Romo Dunze, so yep. the Patriots will have a good connection there. Um, what I didn't expect in this one, because um, I and Jack Jack in the chat asked why Odunze over Alt. Um, I love tackle, but I wanted to do a mock here where the Patriots get one of these top three receivers yep. because that is something they've been missing. And if the Patriots can find a way to trade back and still get a high caliber receiver, that I think is a fantastic situation for them. Now, what I didn't expect in this mock, and this is where I'm putting out the simulator, was who was going to be available at pick 23. My plan here was to take a tackle at pick 23. And then we get to the pick, and Brian Thomas Jr. is still on the board. A guy who's also a big receiver, athletic freak, great production, wins on the outside. Yep. So I pick him. And this sets up a scenario for New England where both of your receiver spots on the outside are set and Kendrick Bourne and Demario Douglas and KJ Osborne can all play on the inside where they're best suited, where you can lock up your number one and number two wide receiver spots for hopefully not just the near future, but the long-term future of this franchise. Yep. Well, and, and you know what, the thing about it, what I love about it is that Thomas is an, is a great receiver, but he's a different player than a Dunze. And so you're not drafting two guys that are the same you're drafting two guys that can be dominant but are different players and i think that 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 makes that the the pick make a ton of sense and like you said now you have your wide receiver one and your wide receiver two set like for a long time and then kendrick Bourne's your wide receiver three and demario douglas is your slot and all of a sudden you're looking at it saying whoa the Patriots have like you know assuming a dunze and thomas are as good as we think Patriots have a top 10, you know, offense, offense, uh, sorry, wide receiving core in the league uh, mm -hmm. with that. So possibly, possibly even better. You know, if mm -hmm. that's Roma Dunze is a guy who I think you can compare favorably to a Devontae Parker type guy. Not Devontae Parker, Devontae Adams. Oh my God. And I was um, going to say, I'm like, Jesus there are Christ. two different players. Um, <laughs> if you're getting a Devontae Adams out of him, and Brian Thomas Jr. turns into what he can turn into, which is probably yeah. slightly I – I don't even know who the best comparison for him would be. Um, Jalen Waddle, maybe, but I don't – I think he's, he's, I think bigger. he's bigger. He's bigger than Jalen Waddle. Right. Yeah, he's like – uh, Romo Dunze and Brian Thomas Jr. are the same height. Yeah, um, which is wild. Yeah, both big body guys. But they're both fast, too. That's the crazy thing. Um, so yeah, so that that's how the, the the draft starts with picks eleven and twenty or not eleven seven and twenty three for New England. You get to pick thirty four, and I, I go with Kingsley Suamataia, the tackle from BYU. Mm -hmm. His experience playing on both sides, left and right tackle. He is still raw, but he has all of the athletic traits. You know, really high relative athletic score. The only kind of ding on him is height, and I don't care about tackle height. I care about tackle arm length. Arm that length. is way more important. His arm, his arms are over thirty-four inches. I am, we we are good on that one. Over thirty-three, and I'm good on guys. So if you're in the thirty-fours, you're completely fine. Uh, still a work in progress. But he's a guy who's probably your swing tackle day one, and he's your project for your new offensive line coach Scott Peters to develop and turn into something who can ideally be your long-term left tackle. That's that's what you're going with there. Um, Obviously not a plug and play guy year one, but you're hoping by year two he is your full time starter at left tackle. Right, I agree with you. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I like that a lot. And you know, the only thing is you you go back to a guy they drafted in the first round, Isaiah Win, six three, thirty three and three eighths arms. So like, you know, and it's not quite as long, but close, right? And so, but I do think that Win 
when he played was fairly talented. It's just that he had a billion injuries and couldn't stay on the field. And I, I don't, that's not Kingsley's problem. What people forget about Isaiah Wynn is that he actually was a really good tackle for one year. And the problem yeah. was it was the one season before the Patriots had to pick up his option. <laughs> right. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. Didn't which work was, out. Uh, which was tough. Yeah. And this is, you know, Wynn's arms were still on the shorter end for a tackle and Sua Mataia's are longer by yeah. quite yeah. a bit. So I'm not worried at all there. We move later on in the draft to pick, was this 68? Yeah, pick 68, third round. Are the Patriots taking Brandon Dorless? I had mentioned this at the top. We were talking with Phil, defensive lineman out of Oregon. Um, he's, you could call him a defensive tackle. You can call him a defensive end. He kind of lines up anywhere in there. He's a little undersized, but he's crazy quick for mm. that position. Uh, and he's got great anchor. He's, he's strong as well. And I think he's a guy who you fit in as a designated pass rusher on the inside on day one and hope he develops into more than that. Uh, but I think the idea here is that, you know, if, if Christian Barmore is going to be getting double teamed all the time, having guys around him who can beat single teams as well, I think gives you a huge pass rush advantage, especially from the inside. And it's a quick guy who played at Oregon. They do a lot of twists and stunts. He has experience with those and, uh, he would fit right in in New England immediately with the types of games they play on the line. And now, you know, with him and Barmore and Keon White and Dietrich Wise and all, all the, yeah, I think, is Equality back this year? I think Equality is back. Equality is back, yep. yep. Yeah, it gives you a lot of options for guys on the inside. You can use as pass rushers to keep everybody fresh. Draft as many. You, you literally cannot have enough pass rushers. Just draft them all. So, I, I you know, that's that's all I want. Just keep drafting trash rushers. And so that's what they're doing here. I like it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I, I like his tape. I think he'd be a fit. Uh, round four, pick 103. We're going Matt Gonsalves. I think I'm saying that correctly. Offensive tackle out of pit. He's kind of the complete opposite of Suamataia. He is not as athletic, but he's got a strong anchor. Yep. And he's not the, he's like he's not the quickest guy, but he's already pretty sound. He could be a road grader in the running game. Um, played left tackle and right tackle. He played a little bit of guard when he was a freshman. I don't know exactly where he's going to fit into the line, but he's a, a guy you can move around to. I think is pretty good right off the bat. Uh, yeah. I don't think he'll ever be a franchise tackle because I don't think he has the quickness to really be you know a blindside protector or anything. But I think he can be a swing tackle for you. Um, I think he can play guard for you. I think he can be a really high quality backup. And you know, you're just taking another shot at the position. If he's better than you think, if he can, w if he's quicker than you think, then you know it, he can be a, a guy who can be a good tackle. You know, he gave up no sacks in the last two seasons. Yeah. Well, and that's and look, you, your tackles stink. They stink, and so you need more tackles. You need good tackles, and it, you sign Chucks, which is good, but the, you're a long way from being done. So in my opinion, the more guys you can get, and especially a guy that has the the uh, college playing pedigree that he does, to me it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Yep. Um, then you know, we get to the is this late fourth here. Uh, round or, five. Yeah. yeah, round five. Pick 137. Isaac Garendo from – Louisville, I think what you need to know about this guy is that he's 221 pounds and he ran a 4-3-3 40-yard dash. Yep. He's fast. Mm -hmm. He's a little bit older for running back prospect. He was at Wisconsin for four years and then transferred to Louisville. And he was behind some good backs at Wisconsin and didn't get playing time, so he's older. But he was blocked for playing time by good players, and he doesn't have that much tread on, on the – he doesn't have a lot of wear on his tires right now. He, you know, he hasn't, hasn't run a lot. So he's older, but I'm not concerned about it. Um, he's tall. For a running back, but he's big, he's fast, he's physical, uh, he's very willing in pass protection. You can use him as a receiver too. I think he had over 200 yards receiving last year. So as a, a backup, complementary back to the guys they have, I think he's really good year one. And if he develops into something else, awesome. Yeah. Yep. No, I like it. I mean, again, speed, 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 speed. Get, give me the fast guys and and see what they can do. And again, you're in the fifth round here, like. Just take a guy and see what happens and, you know, go from there. A guy that's big, has good contact balance, stays up, doesn't yeah. go down from the first guy off and, and has 4-3 speed. I mean, I'll take it. Yeah, and it's, you know, there's some similarities here with the Pierre Strong pick. And I think the issue with the Pierre Strong pick was that 
Kaiju didn't end up turned into that good of a player, but it doesn't mean the methodology was flawed. Like, right. Take a, take a big fast guy and see if you turn him into something. I yep. got, I got nothing wrong with that. And Pat stats of the comments said, I'm going to the guy who Isaac couldn't win a starting spot from. And that's Braylon Allen. That's a running back from Wisconsin. Who's also in this draft. Who's also a big, strong, fast guy. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen that picture of Braylon Allen. There's a picture of him going around uh, where he's just absolutely jacked and it really? looks ridiculous. And somebody like posted it like, Oh, look how jacked this dude is. And Braylon Allen responds to it. He goes, yeah, like I'm, I'm 17 in this picture. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. I'll just, I'll just send that to you after this. Oh my uh, God. So yeah, he is, he is something else. Um, Keep, we'll keep going in this one. Round six, take a tight end, A.J. Barner from Michigan. He's the, yeah, of Michigan, the guys yeah. who are going to get drafted this year. He was the best graded run blocker by PFF. Doesn't do much in the passing game, but he's tough. He's a good blocker. He can be a tight end three right away. and He might not be better than that, but we're talking about round six right here. If you can get a mm-hmm. high-quality backup tight end, I think you take it. I agree. I like it. I like it. And I I'd like I really like the next two picks that you got. Um in the sixth round, MJ Devonshire from Pittsburgh with the yeah. long, with the huge ash wingspan. Um, yeah. I like that a lot, man. And again, yeah. he's a press man guy, right? Like that, that's, that's what you want is a press man guy from the outside. And so I like that pick, uh, quite a bit. And this last one is a guy that I haven't really seen much on. Um, but talk about him for, for your last pick for just a second, yeah. because I think that, you know, this is the type of guy that they need uh, that could help them in, in the back end of their defense. Yeah. So, yeah, it was the sixth round. The other pick was MJ Devonshire from Pittsburgh, who's got this. He's a 5'11 corner with a 6'6 wingspan. Yeah. Dominique Hampton, the safety or general DB from Washington, um, he has a 6'7 wingspan. He's fast, he hits hard. He's physical. He still has a lot of maturing to do when it comes to, you know, reading defenses or taking the proper angles at points, things like that. But he's a really good athlete, and he makes plays at the catch point. Um, and, you know, I, I my philosophy here when it comes to guys drafting at this point is that if you draft really good athletes, you get a really high ceiling. You also draft really good athletes. You get guys who can be an instant impact on special teams for you. You know, yeah. that's a guy who if you draft him in the seventh round, they have a, a sure fire path to make the roster. Guy, guys like Devonshire here and, and Hampton, Hampton. Um, yep. If they can play decently on defense and use that athleticism on special teams, they'll make the roster, and that gives them the ability to stick around and have opportunities for development. Give themselves, put themselves in a position to take steps and get opportunities in the future. Uh, you know, you just take big guys with, with big wingspans who can run fast, and eventually one of them pans out. You get a really good player out of it. Hundred <laughs> percent, I couldn't agree more. And you know, you look at what they did last year at the end of the draft with um, the kid from Jackson State, um, Isaiah Bolden, mm-hmm. fast guy, big guy. You know, like and see what happens. Of course, he got hurt, and so you know, we'll, we'll see how he, he continues to develop. But like. I, I, there's nothing wrong with taking bigger guys who are fast that can move. That's huge for you. Huge. And yeah. so, and so that's kind of the way I look at it. And look, you know, you didn't take a quarterback, but I think that there are other ways to acquire quarterbacks. Um, you know, whether it's, I don't know whether it's, you know, through free agency, whether it's the undrafted free agent market, whether that's, you know, whatever the case may be. I, I just think that if you don't love a quarterback here, then you're fixing basically everything else. And you're saying, all right, next year, we're either going to sign Dak Prescott in free agency or we're going to, you know, have the pieces to acquire a quarterback early in the draft next year. And and you kind of go from there. And, you know, I mean, who knows what's going to be available next year, but that's, that's kind of that's my feeling behind it, at least. So yeah, well, I, I mean, I think I, I have the opinion. Like, I, I'm lower on this quarterback draft than a lot of people are, um, and part of that is like if I'm New England, like you need a quarterback, but you also need so much that yeah. I don't like the idea of just throwing away picks trying to do quarterback. And it's like if you're if you like a guy, take him round one. But if we're unless you know Michael Penix is there in the third round. I'm not necessarily on board with using a third rounder on a, you know, Spencer Rattler because these guys work out 
so rarely. Um, and the guys who work out usually have good supporting casts. Like Brock Purdy is a very good supporting cast that has given him more opportunities to develop into what he is now. Look at Dak Prescott, who's a success story there. Really good supporting cast. Jalen Hurts, very good supporting cast. That That's part of what helps them develop. Um, and you can cater an offense to their strengths by having players that you can scheme around. The Patriots just aren't there. And I'd rather take more shots at getting those players. And a draft like this, you know, you, you take a lot of guys who can be part of the future of the team and can be core players, and you get a future first in in the whole thing. And you, if you can... You can do a lot of things to that future first. And if they don't like a quarterback in next year's draft either, guess what? You still have two first-round picks, and at least one of them is probably going to be pretty high. Mm -hmm. And you can go stack the offense even more with right. players. Rebuild the defense. Have a crazy good team outside of the quarterback position, and then take a quarterback in the second round or third round and take your shot then. Or yep. take one the year after. And obviously, I don't like punting on the position. Yeah, most of course, position right. in sports for three years. But like, yeah. this team is not good. And um, I'm, I'm not trying to just throw away picks on bad shots at the quarterback position just to say we took a shot. 100%. The worst thing you can do is draft the wrong quarterback. That's the worst thing you can do. It's worse than not drafting a quarterback. If you if you don't take the right guy, if you don't believe in the guy, and you take a guy anyways, it just doesn't make any sense. You have to believe that that guy is the guy. Yeah. You know, and so that's that's the issue for me. Uh, TJ, the, the answer no one like the reason why no one likes Joe Milton is because um, I'm going to quote, is it Evan Lazar or Alex Barth who says Barth? Yeah, Alex Barth. If you need an 80 yard touch, if you need an 80 yard pass, Joe Milton will give you an 80 yard pass. If you need a five yard out, Joe Milton will give you an 80 yard pass. He just he can't, he couldn't hit he he, he couldn't fall out of a boat and hit water. He just he couldn't. Yeah. Like it's just not, you know. So yeah, and Nelson Nelson says he's another Cam Newton. If he was another Cam Newton, he'd be going with number one overall. That's correct. Yeah. That's There's correct. a reason a guy with those athletic traits is going on day three right. in this draft. Right. Um, like yeah. he's, and it's, I love the athletic traits, you know, oh, I'm a yeah. Michigan guy and Joe Milton was a Michigan guy and I'll stand for that all day, but like, it's rough. And that's like, if we go, if we go back a little bit, like the Patriots drafted Jarrett Stidham. I liked Jarrett Stidham's tape that year more than anybody I've watched. Who's a day yeah. three pick. Yeah. I like Jarrett Stidham's Auburn tape more than I like the Spencer Rattler tape. <laughs> That I've seen. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I gotta do more Spencer Rattler stuff, but we're talking about Jared Sidham, who was a fourth round pick who didn't turn into anything. Right. Uh, I think the depth of this year's quarterback class is really bad. And I'm just not like I, I would if we're gonna take low odd shots at, at people, like let's go for odds that are slightly better at, at positions like wide receiver or tight end, where they also really need the help, and you find those guys more often at that point in the draft. Yeah. And TJ, by the way, he did not hurt his stock at the combine. He didn't at all. People had him in the sixth round anyways. Uh, you know, yeah. and the, and look, there are some other guys, you know, obviously we talked about Nick's Jordan Travis, another guy on the list. Like those are guys that are just down the line and, and put it this way. I have a friend who's a, who's a big Tennessee guy, loves Tennessee football, is a Titans fan, writes about Tennessee, uh, you know, and, and is a huge volunteers guy. And I asked him about Joe Mixon and he said, you, he goes, do not. Pray to God <laughs> that your team does not draft Joe Mix. Joe, uh, uh, what's his name? Joe Milton. Uh, Joe Milton. And I said, okay, yeah. that's, that's all. That's I need guys, to yeah, that's he's that kind of guy. And it's the, the athletic traits are eye popping, but the rest. Is, right. uh, and I, there's a question: Where would I rank Davis Mills if he was in this class? I think I'd probably put him in the Bo Nix, Michael Penix tier. Yeah, probably right around yeah. there. Yeah, it makes like, sense. Uh, yeah, which I, I also didn't love Davis Mills. Coming well, out. and that's the situation. That's what, listen, that's what Belichick wanted to do, right, at 15, was punt quarterback at 15 and, and take Davis Mills. And, and look, if the Patriots decide to punt quarterback in the first round and take Bo Nix in the second or third round, or even Spencer Rattler, like, I don't love it, and it's not going to fix the position, but, like, I don't necessarily hate it if they're going to build up their offense around them. So, you know, it, it, it's... It's a tough situation, man. It's a tough call. Those guys aren't going number three overall. There's a reason for that. Um, but, you know, I don't, we'll see. We'll see what happens. So, um, yeah. all right. Do you well, want to fly? I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll throw in one more point here, too, uh, before we go to the mock drafts. I think it's interesting because we look at, like, where quarterbacks are taken. Uh, Drake May is a prospect to me. 
He reminds me of Josh Allen. Mm-hmm. There's some some Justin Herbert there. He reminds me of Jordan Love. Yeah. Justin Herbert went at what pick five. Josh Allen went at was it seven? Seven. Eight. Yeah. Yeah. And Jordan Love went at twenty four. We're talking about this guy being picked at pick two or pick three. Right. Jaden Daniels. Who is he being comped to? We're talking Justin Fields. We're talking Lamar Jackson. Justin Fields went at pick eleven. Lamar Jackson went at pick thirty two. We're talking about Jaden Daniels at pick two or three. Um I think it's just the the success of some of those guys has pushed these quarterbacks up the board, even though I'm mm-hmm. not sure if like it's the 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 way the league views the QBs in the draft is highly dependent on which quarterbacks just played well the last season. Like if, like that's that's what's a, a factor here. If right. if Lamar Jackson doesn't win MVP, are we talking about Jaden Daniels in this light? Like that's well, Right. That's that's the question. I mean, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'll tell you, like Patrick Mahomes was number 10 overall. No. Patrick Mahomes was number 10 overall because everyone looked at him and said, well, I, I don't know what he's going to do. I have yeah. no idea. And, and Matt, Matt Nieto says Her- Herbert was six. Not five. Right. Yeah, right. But wrong. yeah, because Tua went five. But, you know, but still, so you, you look at same, it. Yeah. Right. You look at it and to me, it's, you know, you ask the question, right? You look at it and say, well, I don't, I don't know. Like Mahomes goes 10. Well, now we have Mahomes. So Caleb Williams go number one, right? Like Drake May goes number one. Like ten years ago, Drake May goes number one, probably, most likely. Oh, I right. See, Dude, ten years ago, Bo Nix might go number one. See, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah, like that's. I feel, I feel I feel the opposite about Drake and May because um, Josh Allen is kind of the proof point to me for Drake May because Josh Allen is the guy. He's the first notable guy I can think of who wasn't accurate in college who got yeah. accurate in any way in the NFL and. Before that, you know, the the coaching advice on quarterbacks was the one thing you can't teach is accuracy. If you can't hit you can't hit people, don't draft them. Drake right. May in, you know, 2004 with some of those other guys, what is he, fourth, fifth quarterback off the board? Probably not earlier than that, even with the production, because they liked guys who were pinpoint accurate above anything else. Yeah, but you're not wrong though, but but the other thing, the, my counterpoint would be that. You know, and and look, it's not all down the field throws, but he had a sixty six percent completion percentage, percentage the last two years. So, like, it's not yeah, as that though is, that is you know, sixty six, sixty six, and then sixty three last year. But like, so you know, to me, you're talking about a guy that that is fairly accurate, not as accurate as you would like, mm-hmm. but is fairly accurate. Um, yeah. And that's that's the big thing for me. If he throws sixty percent you're happy with 60%, right? Yeah. Is he off the mark every now and again? Yeah. But like, that's because he can, you know, he tries to throw it. He throws the hell out of the ball and gets the ball down there. And so that's, that's the thing for me. So, so we'll see. Yeah. And I will, one, I'll, I keep saying one more point, one more point before we get to the fan mocks. DJ Daniel says, uh, Josh Allen is an anomaly. Uh, when people say may will be fine. Look at Allen. I cringe. I, I get that. And I think yeah. one of the hardest points about this is that, you're looking for the anomaly. You know, Patrick Mahomes was the second quarterback off the board. Josh Allen was the third. Lamar Jackson was the fifth. Right. Um, a lot of these guys, you know, obviously Tom Brady being the sixth in the the or the seventh in the sixth round. Of course, um, yeah. The hard part about this whole thing is that we are kind of looking for the anomaly. And if anybody could do it, if it was easy to find, you know, everybody would be doing it. Um it's a very hard thing to do because you're looking at you're, you're trying to scout if a guy who's 21 or 22 years old in four years can become one of the five to ten most successful people at his position in the entire world. Yeah. Um, if running totally different schemes from what they did in college and in a different environment and with different people around them. And you're literally trying to predict the future. This is very hard to do. And that's why I'm. Unless you really love a guy, I'm always a proponent of building as much insurance into it, as much insulation into the team as possible, and just getting good pieces and seeing what happens with it. (laughs) Right. Well, and, you know, so there's another point here that, you know, uh, Patriots Loco says, which is true, that Josh Allen was allowed to suck for two years and then became decent in year three. Good luck with that slow burn with, with Patriots fans. I agree with that. What I will tell you is that I don't think you have to start him right away. I don't think Drake may has to start year one. 
I think you could dr- start Drake May year two. Now, does that mean he's a year behind in his development? I don't know, maybe. But I think that you can you can help him to get to a point where he's making smarter decisions. Um, you know, and so we'll see. I, I don't know. Again, it the hard thing is is that right now what's happening is that people have different opinions about different players. Right. And there are guys that, you know, it's like I go back and forth with coach coach Williams on, um, on Twitter. He hates Drake may doesn't hate Drake may, but he thinks Drake may isn't good. And he loves Jaden Daniels. And so we go back and forth because he has all these points about Jaden Daniels and why Jaden Daniels is so good. And Michael Penix is so good. And, you know, and, and, and Drake may isn't, but then he says, well, Ben McAdoo's not going to want Drake May because he had this. And I'm like, well, if he had Josh Allen number one, like, what are you talking about? You know, so, yeah. you know, it, you go back and forth. And this is the thing is that we can we can argue about it all day and we will argue about it all day. Here we are an hour yeah. and a half in. Right. We, we're going to keep arguing. We're going to keep <laughs> arguing it. Great. But like. It's not about what we want at the end of the day. Right. And of course, we all want to be right about our takes. But, you know, I I wonder where we're going to go from here. And I wonder what the Patriots think. Cause that's the, that's the only real question is what do the Patriots think? How do they view those guys and what decision are they going to make? Right. And of course we don't know that um, yeah. leading up to it, but, but I think it's, I think it's interesting for me um, when you look at that. And the other, the other thing for me is that, you know, and maybe it has some, something to do with it. I don't know, but, Look at Michael Penix and the guys he was thrown to. Look at Jaden Daniels and the guy he was he, guys he was thrown to. Even Caleb Williams last year, Jordan Addison, who goes in the first round. Now look at Drake May and the guys he's thrown to. Does he have anyone? I mean, Tez Walker, I guess. Who do they have? Diami Di- Brown, I get, but like was Diami Brown even there was, when when he was there? Uh, who was not when he was started? You're thinking Josh Downs. It's Josh Downs about Josh that. Downs, right? Yeah. So that's it. That's really yep. it. You know, yeah. and so and Tez Walker, but Tez Walker can't catch the ball, and well, you know, played and games. He, I was gonna say, and he was hurt for half the year. So, you know, it, that's the stuff for me that I, you know, you wonder if he had had better talent around him, would he, would he have been better, right? Mm-hmm. You don't know, and and look, there's an argument to be made that you know Joe Bar, someone said Joe Bar made Chase and, and Jefferson, which I don't believe. But there's an argument to be made that if you're a good enough quarterback, you'll make those guys better. But if they're just not talented, they're just not talented. What do you, you know? Like, yeah. yeah. And Drake may threw for crazy yards with bad, bad receivers too. Um, right. I'll, I'll, I'll bring up this point from Pat stats. Um, he says, I love when people say, look what happened. They lost Josh Downs. His numbers went down and Jane Daniels has two first round re- wide receivers and Josh Downs would be a day three pick this year. Um, I think just bringing that up to talk about when the numbers go down, worth pointing out, Caleb Williams also had a worse year this year. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Josh Allen very notably had a worse year the year before he came out. Uh, a similar profile to Drake May in that he had a, a really, really, really good year, and then everybody left, and then he had a down year after that, and people weren't sure what to make of that. Uh, another guy who, you know, to an extent had a down year was Lamar Jackson. He won the yeah. Heisman and then had to follow it up. I don't think that's unlike what we've seen with Caleb Williams, who won the Heisman and then had right. to follow it up and because you weren't able to top that. You aren't, you know, it's seen as somehow a ding on your profile to some people. Um, I think, you know, what they did just last year and not taking into account the full body of work is uh, not not a process that's going to land you the best results. And I think that's something that goes for, uh, you know, the Jaden Daniels and Bo Nix and Michael Penix of the world, all guys who had struggled at points previous to the situations that they're in right now. You know, you got to look at that as well. And you know, who who Jaden Daniels was at ASU or who Bo Nix was at Auburn isn't that relevant to what they are now. You still got to look at it. You want to see the trajectory. You want to see why the stats are changing, not just the fact that the stats are changing. And uh, I'm not worried about the fact that Drake May's production went down this year at all that's right. the process was fine for the most part um, yeah i agree uh, I, I will say so there was a there was another conversation that was happening when phil was on about you know running quarterbacks and you know and and not winning championships and so on and so forth and and then the argument about there was an argument going on about what's it called um 
whether Patrick Mahomes is an athletic quarterback. And I was like, come on. Like, that's the most insane thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Whether Patrick <laughs> Mahomes is a, a, like um, – He's what? a mobile quarterback. He's a mobile he is quarterback. A 100% a mobile well, quarterback. Like, anyone that says Patrick Mahomes isn't a mobile quarterback, you're outside of your mind. Like, yeah. the guy, that's what he does. That's what makes him so great is the mm-hmm. ability to move the pocket, to make plays that aren't there – and then make incredible throws. Like, I don't – what else are you looking at? You know what yeah. I mean? Like, and I, yes, is he Lamar Jackson? No, of course not. But the ability to extend the play and move outside of the pocket and then make ridiculous throws, at t- like, that's exactly what you're looking for from your quarterback, which is the reason why Caleb Williams is going number one this year. Yeah, but That, to me, that's, that's, you know – that's everything. He's not, again, he's not, you're not going to put him in the gym and be like, oh my God, this guy's a freak athlete. But when he plays the quarterback position, you're like, oh, whoa, okay, I get it now. Yeah. When I think you look at today's NFL, uh, it's more important than ever to have a guy who can extend plays from the pocket, from outside the pocket as a quarterback, because right. defenses play so much zone and they're so good at it that a lot of times you know, guys aren't going to be open at first. And the way that you can get guys open is, you know, extend the play and give your receivers more time. And also, if you're a running threat at all, when you're moving around, then the defense is going to respond to you. And it just puts more pressure on them. And you can find a seam or a crack somewhere to find a receiver and get them open. And You know, we talk about Josh Allen and Patrick Holmes and Lamar Jackson, but we've seen Tom Brady do this. Not to the degree of some of the other guys, but... but Go back to 2010 and watch his touchdown pass to Brandon Tate against the Vikings where he's rolling out and and throwing over guys. Uh, You look at Tampa. It's one of Brady's greatest assets is that when guys weren't open, he was very good at extending plays from the pocket or moving within the pocket or moving just outside of the pocket to get guys open and make accurate throws on the move. Uh, Obviously, not quite as not the, the, this move isn't quite as fast as what other guys are doing. Uh, really, These right. aren't quite yeah. as athletic, but it's still making plays on the run, um, extend plays, make defenders defend for five seconds instead of three. Uh, that's that's a lot of it here. And right, uh, that, you know, if defenses are doing everything they can to play zone and stop the deep pass, then you have to have guys who are going to create these extra plays. You just have to. You're not going to win in the NFL. Yeah. Well, and the biggest issue to me, it, what's what's so funny is that, you know, the argument going on in the chat right now is about running quarterbacks can't win in the NFL. You know, look at Lamar Jackson, look at this guy. It's like if if the Ravens offensive coordinator hadn't fallen asleep at the wheel in the AFC Championship game, they win that game, right? If if he's allowed to run, they win that game. <laughs> that's, that's what's crazy to me is that it, it's – it's not always on, you know, the the running quarterback necessarily. And there, I mean, there are some times when you can look, but like, you know, so that that's that's the issue for me is that there's more to the story than just, well, running quarterbacks don't win in the NFL. I mean, it's just that's a little bit too much. Well, yeah. I mean, again, does Jalen Hurts win a, win a Super Bowl if he's not playing against Patrick Mahomes? Probably. Probably, right? But Patrick Mahomes is also a very mobile quarterback. So that, Patrick so Mahomes won thing. Super Bowl this year because he picked right. up a crucial first down on the run in overtime. Like, what yeah. are we talking about? Right, right. So that's <laughs> like the, that's the stuff, you know what I mean? It, and it's obviously he's not a running quarterback, but when you watch the 28-3 to game highlights, we're talking about the Patriots against the Falcons. Does everybody forget Brady picking up a huge third down conversion with his legs as part of that? You know, you got the great NFL film shot in slow mo of the gazelle that is Tom Brady <laughs> running down the field trying to pick up a first down in that game. It sure. was a, a huge, a pivotal play to set up the, the first touchdown to James White. So yeah. Um, true. Yeah, no, you need you need guys who can extend with their legs. Um, That's a good point. And and given that, I think all of the top guys in this draft can. Even Michael Penix, who's probably the worst of anybody up there, can yeah. is athletic enough to do it and has done it on tape. Even even Bo Nix, even Bo Nix can do it, right? Bo and Nix, so that's Bo Nix is that's, good at. They call design yeah. runs for Bo Nix. So yep, yeah. yep. So, so anyways, all right. Let's let's get through. We can't do all five of these mocks. Let's get through like two of these mocks, and then we'll we'll push some till next week because we yeah. just we're going. We're already at an, at an hour and a half here. Okay. We're pushing eleven thirty, and uh, and I gotta I gotta go to bed. 
Okay. Well, I had there there were two that we had in here that were deep in the inbox, and I realized we hadn't hadn't gotten to yet. These are right, like two weeks ago. Do, so we'll let's pull do those, those two. two, and then yeah. and then we'll leave the rest. Uh, yeah. You know, if we yeah. do a show this week, which it sounds like we're not doing a show later on, and you know, a second show we're this gonna, week because, but we'll see. It's yeah, we're gonna see about the the show later this week. We have uh, we're, we're working on some stuff there, uh, but uh, Nelson, Tim, and John, we will see your drafts in the future. And by the way, there's a few people that emailed me today um, that I just didn't get over to you. And so this, well, there are the mocks in there uh, in the email, which we saw, which again, email, if you're going to email us, email Pat's Nation Network at gmail.com. Uh, and we'll go from there. Next week on Monday, uh, we're going to have, um, we're going to have my guy on Austin Gale uh, from the athletic, uh, from, sorry, from the ringer. Flipping love that guy. So maybe we'll go through some of those uh, mock drafts with, with him, him as well. So that we should be, also, be fun. you know, what we should do because I think we haven't. I'm, I'm bringing this up on air just to talk about it for our live draft show. I think because the Patriots pick near the top, we're probably going to go earlier and do a pre-show yeah. too, some pre-game. Yep. Um, and if that's the case, we could probably rip a couple of mock drafts right before he's the last it. ditch mocks in right before the draft starts. I absolutely love it. I absolutely love yeah. it. And by the way, don't owe oh, me mom. Do not apologize for sending me mocks late. I don't <laughs> care. Send me mocks whenever you want to send mocks. We just may no, not Pat, be able to get them in on time. That's all. No, Pat, Pat's a t- you get a bad grade now, old man. Mom. Pat's going <laughs> to, Pat's going to ding you points for it. Pass the due date. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So we're going to start here with Zach. This is from Zach Salant. I hope I'm hope saying your name right. Uh, pick number three, it's Jaden Daniels. Pick 34, Tyler Guyton, tackle from Oklahoma. 68, Ben Sinnott. We love the Ben love Sinnott it. pick. Love it. 103, Karan Amagaji, tackle from Yale. 137, Luke McCaffrey, wide receiver from Rice. 180, Elijah Jones, corner from Boston College. 193, Isaiah Davis, running back from South Dakota State. And two thirty one Aeneas Smith, wide receiver, Texas A and M. Thoughts, Pat? I like it. I like it. You know, again, we I don't love Daniels, but but you know, for me, if you like Daniels, taking him at three is a no brainer. Tyler Guyton, I like a lot of thirty four. Ben Sinnott, we know how I feel about Ben Sinnott. Amagaji, I don't know if he's going to make it to one hundred three, but you know, we talked about him already. I mean, that's you know, that's what you're talking about there. And then you draft McCaffrey. And a wide receiver late, um, you know, and you t- kind of take a shot at that. I don't love the fact that you're pushing. Obviously, I love Ben Sinnott, but I don't love the fact that you're kind of waiting so long for wide receiver. I do think Luke McCaffrey has a chance to be um, to be a really good player. I don't know if it's going to happen this year, but I think he has a chance to be a really good player. I'm curious about Smith. I haven't seen much about him, so I don't know uh, where that comes from. I mean, you know, what what he could be. But I do, um, I do like the draft. Yeah, I, I have to look. I haven't watched Isaiah Davis yet, um, the running back there in day three. So I can't yes. comment. I can't really comment on a lot of the day, the late day three guys there. Um, the first five picks I like. Um, I one of the things that I think is interesting here, um, and this is just a general thing because I just did it in my mock draft too. I just took two tackles in my mock. I think. We kind of came into this thinking the Patriots need two tackles. And now the Patriots have Michael Wenu at right tackle and have him locked True. up. And I don't know if they need two tackles. I'm not yeah. mad at it. Like, I'm not upset with it here. But I also look at, you know, Guyton and Amagaji. And I look at there's 103 a spot where you're taking a receiver instead of a tackle um, and switching it up here. Um, Good point. Good point. Yeah, and that's and that's a general draft strategy thing. You know, I'm, I'm still recalibrating to some of the stuff and, that's that's one of the balances here is you know you can you could say they need to fix wide receiver throw picks at wide receiver but also if you draft a guy who's going to start for you at wide receiver do you need to take more if you draft a guy who's going to start for you at left tackle do you need to take more you're only going to put so many guys in the field there's only going to be so many guys on your 53 man roster and right kind of spread the picks around a little bit so yeah uh, no, i agree with you oh and that's the yeah. thing again you know who knows when this is if this pick is from a few weeks ago then of course that makes sense right so yeah. um, this is from after all when it resigned I, I just googled it to make sure. okay okay yeah right. yeah um uh, and then our other one here uh, this is from nicholas engberg he also has Jaden daniels at the top pick but with a trade back to five picking up okay. another capital in there which i think is interesting uh, I'm actually looking at that. I'm thinking about five. 
That's got to be the Chargers jumping up, presumably a jump Arizona for a receiver, which I think would be mm-hmm. very interesting. Uh, pick 34 is Kingsley Suamatia. 37, Roman Wilson, wide receiver from Michigan. 104, Brendan Rice, wide receiver from USC. 137, yep. Theo Johnson, tight end Penn State. 174, Isaac Garendo, running back Louisville. Uh, 180, Gabe Hall, defensive tackle from Baylor. 193, Tylen Grable, tackle from UCF. And 231, Jalen Simpson, safety from Auburn. Yep, love Jalen Simpson. I uh, had him in my last mock. Again, you know, you're 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 double dipping at wide receiver early here. He's got a few guys from your mock. Uh, are you stealing yeah. guys from from you? With, I you I found this after, and I was like, "Are you kidding me?" Because there's I think two guys in the exact same <laughs> draft slot. Yeah, yeah. Garendo and, uh, and Sumatia with the same pick. Yeah, yeah. Um, although Garendo, I guess, was a trade from him, so maybe not. Oh no, is that the oh, trade? The Wait, it wasn't trade. the same pick. I'd go out 137. And 137, 134. okay. Either way, but I, I like the idea of going Roman, Roman Wilson and then Brendan Rice. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, you know we, you know how I feel about Jalen Simpson. I had him in one of my mocks. I think he, he has the potential to be a free safety for the Patriots, which I think could be interesting. Um, you know, and then, and then Theo Johnson, to me, I don't know if Theo Johnson can play tight end, but – He's the prototypical guy that you would draft at tight end that hits in the NFL. A guy that, um, you know, a guy that has the physical measurements and is a freak. And if you can teach him to play the position, it's not going to happen right away. It's going to take a few years. But if you can teach him to play the position, he could be a dominant tight end in the league. If, you know, again, if he puts the work in and if you coach him upright, I think you could do it. And so, you know, getting the quarterback, getting the left tackle, and then double dipping at wide receiver and getting a potential guy that could start a tight end, uh, along with, you know, then another running back, I think it's solid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot to like there. I'm a big Gabe Hall guy. I like that pick a lot. Um, yeah. I'm not, I, I, you know, me, how I feel with the quarterback on this. I'm not, I'm not Jim Daniels guy. But, right. You know, if they pick them, they pick them. We'll rally around them. You know, I'll, right. I'll say what I'll say now. Once, Whoever they pick, once they're a Patriot, I'm all in. <laughs> like that's that's how all it's those be. question marks. Let me tell you something. If Jaden Daniels gets drafted at number three, all those question marks I'm putting aside. Ah, you can still figure it out. They'll figure. Listen, well, no. I, you got to trust them. I got it. You know, I've said yeah. I'm going to trust them. I got to trust them. What are we going to do? You know, and then we go from there and see what happens. Yep. So yeah, that's it. Uh, so yeah, sorry to John, Tim, and Nelson. We're going to get to your mocks later on in the process, but they are ready to go. We'll yep. be bringing those on air. Yep. Now we will. And that's, you know, we'll get to, we'll get to them all. We'll try to get to them all and, and we'll go from there. Uh, by the way, I did see my dad this weekend. We were at Patriot place. We went to the draft, pre- uh, draft preview party, which was a ton of fun, but we forgot to, uh, what, I don't know if we forgot necessarily. We really didn't have the time to get to, uh, the pro shop. So we will get to the pro shop. <laughs> um, we will, we will get him something there, take a picture and, and post it on Twitter, which he doesn't yes. have, but you know, do we'll it. do it. We'll do it for the show. Wait. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, and then and that's it. And then we're gonna we'll try to do. I think we're gonna try to do another giveaway um, on draft night. Those oh, yeah. those hats are so freaking cool. Those hats are so cool. You um, like this year's draft hats? I love it. I absolutely oh. love it. I think it's. awesome. I'm not a. I'm not a fan. No. You know, so you know you know what I was gonna mention. Do you see the new Red Sox hats? That I think I don't remember. I think they're new era. They might be 47 brand. I don't remember which one they. Are. Uh what what are they? They got they got a new one that's like cream with almost like a vintage brown brim. It got like this Red Sox crest thing on the front. I'll send you a link later. No, I haven't seen it. It's very uh, very classic looking, and they got they got a, a couple right now that look really good. Well, that's uh, nice. We're th- not giving thank- we're not giving away a Red Sox hat on the. On no, the we're not. I just I'm <laughs> just, I, thank thank goodness they're so expensive because otherwise I would have parted with my money already. The fact that it's expensive means I haven't bought it for myself. See, there you go. Just saving See? my money for See? once, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's too funny. So, oh man. Well, there you go. So there's that. Thanks for coming through guys. We appreciate it. Thanks to Phil for coming on. As always, we love having Phil on here. Um, chat was alive tonight. Uh, we really appreciate all the input. Like, we didn't pull a ton of comments up, but we saw you, we read you, uh, and thank you for coming through and, and participating and being part of the show. You guys make the show, uh, what it is. 
And so we really appreciate you guys coming through. We're almost there. It is April. So it's close. officially April. Uh, exactly. And so we're almost there. And so anyways, so enjoy, enjoy the night. Um, thank you for coming out and we'll talk to you guys. And again, we're in discussions. Here's the deal, right? Right now we're in discussions with a fairly big guest um, that may not be able to do a nighttime show and only a daytime show. If that's the case, we would do a pre-recorded show and release it pre-recorded and not do a, a live show on Thursday night. If that falls through, then we'll be back uh, here on Thursday night, uh, presumably. So at 945. So we'll keep you guys updated and let you know what's going on and, and then go from there. So, but again, thank you so much for, uh, for stopping by. We appreciate it. And uh, yes, dad, we are talking about you uh, for coming on, 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 uh, this week so but yeah. uh but no but thank you guys we appreciate it and we'll uh we'll talk to you soon like i said either either on thursday night or um or on monday but either way that that just so you know that podcast if we do record that will be recorded and released as a podcast just won't be it won't yeah. Won't oh be yeah, yeah. So, yeah yeah so that's all so anyways so thank you guys we appreciate it we love you and uh and we'll talk to you guys uh we'll talk to you later